Here, I'll give you a visual so I exist. Oh, maybe you don't get to see me. Um, so um, and welcome back, everybody. I hope you had a, a good but short lunch. It's been a great morning, really interesting talks and uh, a great start to uh, the conference. This afternoon, we've got our session on diseases and parasites and a great uh, crew of speakers for the afternoon. And um, our first one, we will start with right away here. It's Kristen Magnuson from the Yukon. She's with the Veterinary Animal Health Unit, Department of the Environment. She studied veterinary medicine in Saskatoon and spent 12 years in clinical practice before she started to work with the, as she says, at the amazing team at the Animal Health Unit with the government of Yukon. So Kristen, we will turn it over to you. And um, just, sorry, before, before you start, again, at, same as this morning, if you have questions, please use the Q&A. And at the end of Kristen's talk, if we have some extra time there, we will, I'll read out those questions. So Kristen, please go ahead. Great, thanks so much for that introduction, Susan. Um, yes, and, uh, and thanks to everyone for having me. I'm going to first thank Jane, who introduced my topic quite nicely, and um, as it, it overlaps with her work. And uh, we do, I do have a lot that I wanna share with you. So I'm gonna jump in as quickly as I can here, but first to acknowledge, um, like I said, our amazing team here at the Animal Health Unit, Dr. James Harms, Dr. Mary Vanderkop, and Dr. Michelle Thompson. Um, over also in Yukon government, um, Matt Larson, Jesse Walchuk, and Matt Ball over at the Agriculture Branch, um, as well as Dr. Tommy Joseph down in Abbotsford at the BC Ministry of Agriculture's Animal Health Center Lab, um, which is where we send our samples to. And of course, the passionate people of the Yukon um, who never cease to inspire and importantly, also to thank our colleagues and our mentors. So as Jane highlighted, the Control Order 2018-001 is an order issued under the Animal Health Act. Um, and this order in particular is jointly issued by the Minister of Energy, Mines and Resources under which the agriculture branch falls and also the Minister of Environment, which is the department that the Animal Health Unit functions under. Um, the animal health, uh, sorry, the, the control order, um, I can tell you all that, that although the control order is new, it just came into effect this January, um, the work to develop this specialized approach to a fairly controversial issue in Yukon took years. Um, Yukon is a unique jurisdiction and the overlap of sheep territory, as, as Jane showed you, overlaps majority of the territory and, and um, definitely encompasses um, some of the farms many of the farms and the vastness of this territory contributes to some of the challenges um, and beauty of it. And then also, of course, the highly valued wildlife and the small but hardy um, small ruminant industry here. The control area is defined as the entire territory. The requirements of the control order, I'm gonna paraphrase a little bit here. Um, and also you can find a copy of the control order document on yukon.ca. Um, I've paraphrased the essence of the requirements here. And uh, so domestic sheep and goats must be kept below a thousand meters elevation in an enclosure approved by an inspector and they must be tested annually with method and results approved by the chief veterinary officer. Uh, each animal has to also be individually identified with permanent identification and producers must keep records, prevent and notify of any escapes and also, if they desire to import from outside a territory, they must apply for an import permit. And the goal of this order is, and these requirements is to protect our wildlife from respiratory pathogens carried by domestic animals with the pathogen of greatest concern being MOV. And given our audience and the previous talks today, I, I won't go into much detail on and those specifics of, of why we focus on MOV, um, but I'm gonna just jump right into um, our approach here. And so, we refer to our, our approach as being a two-pronged approach to mitigating the risk of MOV transmission from domestic populations into wild. And those two prongs, uh, we really look at as the testing and the containment. And so under the testing, we're testing all domestic sheep and goats in the territory, and we're removing positive animals from the population. On the containment side, our, our containment objectives, which I'll go over a little bit more specifically, are basically to keep domestics in and keep wildlife out as best we can and to prevent nose to nose contact across the fence. As I mentioned, the control order came to effect, into effect just this past January, but our work began quite a long while before that. 
The control order was issued in late 2018 and in 2019, the year was spent informing producers of the control order and its requirements, as well as assisting producers to achieve compliance prior to the order coming in effect. The communications obviously were key as many other speakers have alluded to, um, and we held meetings with industry. We used social media to reach as many people as we could and met with producers one-on-one uh, -on -one as needed. And we do approach each farm um, as a unique situation. Um, the control order applies to all, uh, like I said, the entire Yukon and any domestic sheep or goat producers within it. Um, but the farm by farm solutions um, are needed as each individual farm is quite unique. Um, the, in 2019, there was also funding available to assist with the cost of fencing materials because some of that investment was considerable for sure. Um, and folks who determined that they would not be able to comply with the order's requirements, they were eligible for compensation for the loss of their animals if they chose to depopulate. And we did have a few producers um, opt to depopulate. So how do we implement such a thing? So the folks at the agriculture branch within the government of Yukon have been quite critical um, in a link to the industry. And they have also been largely responsible for guiding the containment side of our two-pronged approach. Our two units, um, the agriculture branch and the animal health unit have worked very closely together on this implementation. And that is driven by a recognized need for government to support and invest both in the protection of wildlife and in the small ruminant agriculture industry. The testing and enclosure um, inspections or visits um, visits are scheduled so that a member from the animal health unit and a member from the agriculture branch can attend the farm at the same time, especially on the initial visit. Um, and this complements our two-pronged approach quite well. The date and time are booked around the farm logistics and producer's schedule. And also um, the initial visits are followed up annually uh, with te ongoing testing and inspection of the enclosures. So I'll go into a little bit of detail about the enclosures um, and how we've uh, managed that. Um, certainly um, the main goal and, and the way that we've looked at enclosures is on an outcome-based approach. So looking at keeping domestic animals in, doing our best to keep wildlife out and preventing nose-to-nose -nose contact through some form of separation fencing. So our Enclosure requirements are not prescriptive regarding how the producer meets those objectives and game fencing is not a requirement. We've used a farm by farm approach, usually starting with a site visit um, to look at where the person, where the farmer is, is starting at, what they've got for sort of primary containment to begin with, and then also looking at what their plans are for the property. So that that containment, you know, in some cases we've had that containment that's um, required for the control order also end up doubling as a, a good predator deterrent. Um, so some folks have, have decided to fence um, more of their property so that they can double it up as predator deterrent for things like chicken coops and, and other uh, parts of their own farming production. Once the enclosure is approved, the government of Yukon provides signage and the owner signs a declaration acknowledging the approval and requirements for upkeep and maintenance of that enclosure. We have provided leeway and needed to provide some leeway for folks as fencing construction season is pretty brief here in the Yukon. And having said that though, it was quite remarkable the amount of work done in 2019 and, and, and ongoing on these farms. This is just an example of the the signage that we provide for the farm after an enclosure has been approved. And I'll share with you a few examples of, of enclosures here in the Yukon. In this one, you can see a goat enclosure with a five strand electric offset on the outside. And here, sorry for a bit of the glare on the photo, but uh, electric offset was chosen to be on the inside in this enclosure. The primary fence already existed and was very close to the property line. So the enclosure, uh, the offset was placed on the inside um, of this pygmy goat enclosure. 
Here's an example of a smaller uh, goat enclosure, again, with a large perimeter fence around the entire property. So no use of electric in this situation, but um, sufficiently meeting our requirement to prevent nose to nose contact across the fence line. And here, just one last photo showing a solid barrier on a gate to service separation fencing where secondary fencing or electric offset would not really fit with the functionality of the property. And again, meeting the goal of um, our three objectives of keeping uh, domestics in, wildlife out as best we can, and also preventing nose to nose contact. Now, moving into talking about the testing and, and what we've established there. Um, so our protocol was established uh, based on that concept that MOV being intermittently shed by animals who carry it. We landed on three nasal swabs and, and thanks to others who um, have provided insight on the protocol. Um, and we collect uh, swabs three to five weeks apart, three times. During the, and, and sorry, that protocol really provided us hope to detect the animals that are shedding the bacteria and also to be somewhat reasonable for producers to have to comply with. During the testing period, we place a quarantine order um, and that's to prevent the movement of sheep and goats, uh, domestic sheep or goats in and out of the quarantine area during the testing period. And the quarantine order is also an order under the Animal Health Act. And this therefore allows us to offer compensation for costs incurred by the producer during the quarantine period. For example, producers are eligible to apply for compensation for the cost of their labor spent mustering animals during a testing session. Um, and, uh, and so that's just an example of some of what we've been able to provide for compensation for folks. The swabs that we collect are tested um, by MOV specific real-time PCR at the BC Ministry of Agriculture's Animal Health Centre Laboratory. Um, and positive swabs are confirmed by DNA sequencing. We are holding on to duplicate swabs um, for hopeful strain typing, which we do plan to pursue. It's in the works and however, setting up an out of country contract has not been easy and, uh, and the efforts to do so are still ongoing. So if we do receive a positive result from one of our swabs, then we have a difficult phone call to make to the producer because animals, with a positive swab or issued a direction to be destroyed by the chief veterinary officer. And this again is a direction under the Animal Health Act. During that phone call, we'll discuss um, with the producer to establish a reasonable term for the direction to destroy with consideration given to farm logistics and a genuine desire not to have the animals wasted. Owners can slaughter or use or sell the meat and we've also done euthanasia sort of as you would for a pet. And some home, home owners have been able to rehome um, their animals out of territory. We always hope that that's to an area that is not closely associated with um, wild sheep or goat. There is also compensation. So um, when the direction to destroy has been issued, there's compensation available for the cost of the loss of that animal. And that amount is based on federal guidelines as highlighted on my slide there. I also should mention that in situations where we've had a number of individuals um, test positive or swabs from a number of individuals on a farm test positive and the prevalence has been high enough to suspect that the hazard exists with potentially within the entire herd, we have issued a direction to destroy for the herd on some occasions um, or added additional tests into our protocol um, to determine the prevalence. So what we found in 2019, and I'd like to point out these numbers are tabulated to the end of October 2019, which is our first year of testing in the Yukon in the domestic side. Um, so we tested 190 domestic sheep and 101 of those sheep tested positive which gave us a prevalence of about 53% in our domestic sheep population. And we tested 153 um, domestic goats and 23 of those tested positive for a prevalence of 15% of our domestic goat population testing positive. So in total, we had tests on 343 animals to the end of October, 2019, and 124 of those tested positive. 
So about 36 of all animals tested were positive. And I think it's important to note that most of, uh, almost all in fact, of the positive animals detected were asymptomatic at the time of swabbing. We did see a handful of mild symptoms um, and we did have one flock of sheep with overt respiratory illness in 2019. The distribution of animals with the positive results, again, I think it's important to note that these positive results among the total population of domestics in Yukon were clustered on a relatively low number of farms. Of the 12 sheep farms tested by October 2019, four had positive results. And of the 19 goat farms tested, um, four had positive results. So we're looking at um, that those groupings, which is not surprising knowing what we know about um, the prevalence of MOV in a herd once it's there. So on farms that did have positive results, the mean prevalence for MOV was greater than 60%. And we had found a range um, from the lowest being about 20% in a herd um, and up to 100% in, in one sheep flock. We also um, did determined a, a risk, um, noted a risk with importing animals. Um, and in our 2019 findings, three out of those four sheep farms that had positive individuals had had imports within that year. And four to four of the goat farms had also had imports within that year. And during development of the control order, import was anticipated to be a risk and the order does require an import permit to be issued. Now that the control order is in effect um, and for the next five years, uh, folks who want to import animals from outside the territory will need to apply for an import permit, which does have some conditions. Um, and one thing that we're recommending certainly is pre-testing prior to import. It's recommended, not mandatory at this time because there are some limitations, but we are currently funding the cost to uh, support the lab fee for that, those tests done outside. And we, and we are looking at how potentially Yukon government can provide additional support. Oopsie, sorry. Um, concern from the industry about the difficulty of bringing in new genetics has led to discussion for ways to support perhaps also artificial insemination in the territory. Again, looking at um, listening to what producers are experiencing, knowing that there is quite a large impact on them with this control order and trying to um, support ways to make that impact manageable for them. Compliance, um, one thing that's really struck me while fulfilling my role is the resilience and hard work of folks involved in the industry. We have had excellent compliance from producers across the territory. And there was definitely concern prior to the control order coming into effect that sheep and goats, um, sheep and goat industry uh, as livestock in Yukon would be ruined. However, the numbers are stable as far as we know, and we do continue to see new producers in Yukon. And I think being able to fulfill the mandate that we have to have producers in compliance with the order, order but doing so with a flexible approach has really made it, um, has really helped uh, in getting that compliance. Non-compliance, so certainly, um, you know, we, we do face that and we have uh, a policy set out for that, that um, non-compliance is a, um, no doubt about it, that's an offense under the Animal Health Act, the way that the control order is written. And so if we do have an issue with non-compliance, you know, our first approach is just simple conversation and then an official notification followed by an official warning of non-compliance and uh, you know, ensuring that the folks know that this would be an offense under the Animal Health Act. And then if needed, charges would be laid. We recently, after an investigation, have laid charges of non-compliance with the fencing requirement and a conviction was delivered. We did in 2019, after noting the prevalence in Yukon, we were driven to seek a possible alternative to removal of positives. And thus we undertook a treatment trial, which we couldn't have done without help from Tom Besser and Helen Swansea sharing their experience and their advice. And also a big thank you here to Jane Harms and Mary Vanderkop for um, jumping on this opportunity and working together to make it happen in a chilly week in October of 2019. 
We had a flock of MOV positive sheep and they were quarantined on farm in Yukon. We had 22 uh, adult sheep, um, one ram among 21 ewes, and 90% of them had had positive swab results prior to treatment. We treated with subcutaneous and intranasal enrofloxacin daily for five days, five mg per kg of enro sub-Q once a day, and uh, 0.5 mg per kg enrofloxacin in 20 mils of saline for a nasal flush each of those days as well. And there's a picture of Jane and I bundled up doing uh, nasal flush on a lovely U. Our post-treatment testing, um, so we returned five days later to collect swabs initially from these animals and our prevalence at that time had decreased to 30% and we were feeling quite optimistic. However, when we tested again a month later, 35 days post-treatment, our prevalence had returned to 86%. And at that time, our treatment was deemed unsuccessful um, and the sheep uh, in this treatment group were directed to be destroyed. So while the control order is in effect, um, enclosures are approved and inspected annually and um, testing continues. We are cautiously optimistic as we test flocks and herds that were tested last year, but it's definitely too early to draw conclusions. We were delayed um, due to COVID early this year, so we don't have as many data points as we would need to, to form conclusions at this time. We, as we gather our results, our intentions to share with our sheep and goat industry here in Yukon first. Um, and we, but one thing we do see is that we've identified as a trend from last year, as well as that certainly bringing animals in um, risks bringing in MOV as well. So key messages I would just like to highlight, um, the control order was designed to protect wildlife and still support a viable domestic sheep and goat industry in Yukon. And the government of Yukon's commitment to doing this has gone a long way. Continuing to support the industry and using a flexible approach with fair compensation, ongoing collaboration has been key to leading us to success with this implementation. And we've made good headway toward mitigating the risk in wildlife um, through our two-pronged approach of testing and containment. And we've been able to maintain a positive working relationship with producers. Um, and it has truly been quite fascinating to be involved. And that wraps up what I've got to share. Um, thank you so much for your time. And thank you also to others in the audience who have and will be presenting. Fascinating work, everybody.